Ready for the next topic, Ariely? Yep, yeah, let's go into uh, divorce. Uh, divorce. Yeah, divorce and separation, good status issue here. Uh, yeah, yeah, Lee, I always like to try to add a few sense of humor here. So let me give you one, see if you've heard it before. Why is divorce expensively? Do you know why? Why? It's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, thought I'd add some humor here. Uh, look, if you were, if we were in front of you, if someone in the audience would have actually blown the joke for us, but they can't do that now, so they have to listen anyway. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, what issues do we have in divorce and separation? And actually, probably, Lee, if we really wanted to, we could probably do a whole one-hour webinar just on this topic. We're not obviously here, but we'll pick out the ones that are important here. Joint and several liability. Tax liabilities when filing a joint return. Both spouses are held responsible. Uh, uh, one spouse may be held liable for the tax due on the return, but uh, but it, it, but both are responsible. We could have an innocent spouse. We will be discussing this in a different lesson in this seminar. It's an exception to joint and several liability, and I will tell you, Innocent spouse, you better be dotting every I and crossing every T, which is why we will be covering it more in depth later. Uh, refunds, uh, payment of spouse debts. Joint refund can be withheld to pay one spouse's debts incurred before the marriage. What would these be? Uh, child support, spouse support, federal debts, such as student loan. Be aware of that. We can have what's called an injured spouse. They can get his or her portion of a joint return, return refund by filing Form 8379, which is the injured spouse claim. However, in community property states, depending on state law, the entire refund may still be subject to offset. Uh, uh, good examples of states for this would be, of course, California, but also Idaho, Idaho Louisiana, Texas. Good examples of, uh, of this rule here. Uh, alimony. Uh, uh, that, that's enough. That's the same joke, by the way. Why is divorce expensive? Why is alimony expensive? That's the same joke. Lee. It's it's worth it. It's worthwhile. Uh, it's worth it. Um, anyway, alimony payable is uh, what are what are the rules? And the answer is well, it depends when we got divorced. It depends when we had our agreement because the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act made some interesting changes to alimony issues. Alimony payable under a post after 2018 agreement. So uh, we're starting January 1, 2019. And remember, one of the weird thing about Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, everyone thinks hey, it's started January 1, 2018. Uh, there were a few exceptions. This is one of them. The alimony exception didn't start until 2019. Anyway, you have a post-2018 agreement, payments made, not deductible by the payer, and one, and I think we all know we don't mean itemize deduction. We mean adjustment to gross income, not an adjustment. Payments are not taxable to the recipient. Payments are not earned income for purposes of making an IRA contribution. What is the deal with the uh, with, with this agreement? The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, in dealing with the executed date, specifies the treatment of alimony changes for any divorce separation agreement executed. After December 31, 2018, it is not a question of when the divorce is final or when the paperwork was signed by the judge or recorded. So even if a divorce was final in 2019, the alimony treatment may still be governed by pre-2019 rules. So it's the execution is in here. So what if we have, Lee, a pre-2019 agreement? We follow the old rules. Uh, and uh, again, uh, well, not again. I want you, as a, as we turn prepared, to actually have a copy of the agreement uh, as part of your file. You might need it, it to to prove uh, your position if you get a some sort of a request from the service. Payments are deductible under a pre two thousand nineteen agreement by the payer, and they are treated as taxable to the recipient. Payments are treated as earned income for purpose of making an IRA contribution. Payments must be in cash and required by decree or instrument. So it has to be required, It's not a, otherwise it could be deemed to be a gift. Cannot be child support, cannot be contingent on the status of a child. Uh, what was happening, and one of the reasons I believe that uh, Congress actually made these changes was that the IRS was noting that there was confusion. There were people who were trying to say uh, a child support agreement 
was al was alimony. So uh, if they called alimony, but it's contingent on uh, on the status of a child, it's contingent on uh, on having that child, it might be deemed to truly be child support, and then would not have been deductible. So support not deductible under any circumstances must end on the death of the payee. Uh, who, who is the payee? The person paying we or the person receiving? <laughs> person receiving, right? Pays and receiving. So I, I always like to make sure people understand payor is the person paying, the payee is the recipient. So you might look at it as the person, uh, as recipient. So payee, what that's saying is that let's say the recipient dies, uh, is, can we have alimony that, that, that says you must continue to make payments to the estate of this recipient, which might be going to the child? Well, guess what? That's actually child support. And so you might have a, a, a agreements that say that it's not alimony. It's, that would be child support. That's disguised alimony. Failure to include the terminated death clause converts payments into non-deductible property settlements. Uh, 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 continuing uh, on this next slide, valid only if parties live apart after the decree. Apart means separate households. It doesn't mean separate bedrooms. So one house might not be enough. Uh, if you have two separate entrances, you have a duplex and, and you can separate, separate kitchens, separate uh, living facilities, that would be okay. Still must have an eye out for property settlements disguised as alimony in the first two years of alimony payments because you might have a, set, a series of lump sum issues there. So just be careful here. It may require recapture in third year. This rule is obsolete after 2020. Here's one of these seldom encountered issues. A pre-2019 agreement could specify that payments as non-deductible and non-taxable, but then not earned income for IRA purposes. So you can have non-deductible alimony. I don't know what the reason you would have it as, uh, but yeah, it's they call it alimony, but it's not. It's treated as, as, as spousal. That would be treated as spousal support lately. Modification is uh, alimony can be subject to the post 2018 rules of the modification expressly provides for post 2018 treatment. Be very careful. You represent a client who is agreeing to modify their their alimony, um, and let's say it was under an old rule, so they're going to pay more or less to their ex spouse, and maybe the ex spouse's attorney wrote the agreement and they snuck in. Okay, this will be subject to the new rules. Well, that means that the, that the recipient's not going to be picking up his income, and that also means the payer doesn't get a deduction. Uh, it must be reviewed, and uh, don't assume that the attorneys actually, all attorneys know these tax rules. You could be a really good divorce attorney, and you are ignorant about this. This is something you should actually look at uh, before they sign, if, the, if that's possible. Allocation of tax attributes in divorce and separation. Capital loss carry forwards are attributable to attributed to the spouse or spouses originally incurred the loss. Um, I always have a question for this, Lee. How do you prove that? I guess the uh, you have to go back and look at the ownership of the property and uh, and oh, see I agree. See where the loss occurred. I agree. I but see that what what, what my comment to you, Lee, was uh, does your client really keep records like that? And some of them do, and some don't. Well, some don't, but I think the, the tax return will help a lot. I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, passive loss carryovers, if separately owned, then they stay with that spouse. Where property is jointly owned or is community property, continues if they continues to be owned by both parties after the divorce, it's 50% each. If only one spouse retains property, 50% adjust the basis. The other 50% will then carry over. NOL carryovers. If the NOL is incurred in a year married, 50% to each spouse. If the NOL is incurred prior to marriage, 100% to that spouse. NOL sustained by one spouse before the marriage cannot, when carried to a year in which he or she was married, be used to offset the income of the other spouse. What about estimated tax payments, joint estimated payments? Well, if the parties agree, we can allocate them between themselves. And so, uh, how often do ex-spouses agree? Uh, I Not should say this, often. Lee. I'm, I'm happily married, or at least I'm married for, since 1980. Uh, how often do I agree with my wife? What do you think, <laughs> Lee? Uh, 
politically, not very often. Yeah, politically, I, 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 you know, I live in Pennsylvania, which is a uh, purple state, and uh, I'm not going to get into politics in these elections. But my wife and I haven't even voted for the same candidate, presidential candidate, in the last five presidential elections. My vote is meaningless. My wife will tell you so is my opinion. Anyway, uh, uh, no, but if, if they can agree, allocate, great. If they cannot agree, estimated tax, uh, each can claim equals the total estimated tax paid multiplied by the fraction, which is the tax on their individual return, divided by the sum of the tax shown on their individual individual return for the year. So it does require you to have an advanced degree in mathematics, but there is your formula. Very good. Uh, <laughs> that looks like calculus to me, but you know, Lee, you were an engineer. I wasn't. So uh, anyway. <laughs> Uh, uh, basis uh, at, it, when we dealing with allocations when there are transfers between the spouses recipients basis becomes the same as the transfers adjusted basis uh, the rule applies even when the transaction is a sale between spouses so you can't disguise a, 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 a transaction as a sale for purposes of this basis here or the transfer of property between spouses is incident to a divorce this is actually code section 1015 Lee. Uh, carryover basis generally applies even when the property's basis is less than, equal to, or greater than the property's fair market value. The holding period includes the period held by the transfer. So we keep tying on and tacking, uh, tacking one, not tying one, tacking one holding period under those circumstances. Here are some miscellaneous issues. Ex-spouse retains jointly owned home for some time. If the house is finally sold, the non-occupying co-owner spouse still will qualify for Code Section 121 exclusion treatment. It's based upon the occupying spouse's use period, but can only have that exclusion once every two years. Home buyer credit recapture. Taxpayer that purchased a home in 2008 may have qualified for a credit that is subject to prorated recapture through 2024. Let's not forget that's people forgot about that rule, but still exists. Each spouse is still liable for half, and if a spouse retains the home on which the credit was claimed, that spouse assumes the potential liability for the entire capture recapture. Yeah, it's rare, but probably more less rare than some of the other rare things we've been talking about. Well, Especially our, some of, some of the issues with the with the home is uh, in a in a divorce. Uh, the spouse that keeps the home also assumes a liability for the tax on the home at the end. So if there's, it's a substantially uh, expensive home, uh, might get stuck for some tax they hadn't planned on. I, I, I agree. Uh, some more miscellaneous issues. Family support alimony must terminate on the payee spouse's death. Uh, we talked about this already. Otherwise, Lee, it's not, it's not alimony. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's probably child support, uh, payments required by family support agreements that have not included support terminates of death, uh, provisions have failed to qualify as alimony in, 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 you say recent court cases, I'm going to say in many recent court cases, I'm going to add the word many there. COBRA coverage, a group health plan of an employer must provide, uh, coverage for each qualified beneficiary who would lose coverage under the plan because of divorce, uh, conflict of interest, and this is a word of caution. Can you prepare tax returns for both divorcing spouses? The answer is you can, but you better get waivers from these spouses. And you might say, this is a happy divorce. Uh, Lee, you live in California, so people tend to be a lot more mellow back east. We don't really have happy divorces in Philadelphia. Okay, uh, it's, 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 it, it could be a very violent divorce in Philadelphia, but uh, even in the happiest divorces, there are quote unquote conflicts of interest. It might be your best interest, your firm's best interest, not to represent both parties. Well, there is a, uh, in, the, in the text, mm -hmm. there are in, in, a, in a chapter 07, there is a, uh, a built in. Uh, coverage here where you can fill out the, I mean, a, a disclaimer that you can fill out that we prepared, uh, use at your own risk, of course, but uh, I agree with you, Art. I think you should only do one of them. Uh, I, I had a maybe, funny experience. Maybe not even one of them. Well, that's my funny experience. I actually had a practitioner who called me this year, told me that 
they had a client of his husband wife getting divorced and they both came to him and says you'll represent me to the best and i want you to make sure that that that, that uh yeah that uh you you do everything possible to harm the i mean not I'm, and by the way they didn't use the word harm it was another four letter word uh, uh the other spouse so uh he asked me what should i do i said walk away from both you don't want either even if you took one I think you have a conflict of interest because you represented them both. Walk away. Said, tell them both get different people. You're just you're uh, uh, you're opening yourself up to a to, to massive problems. I agree with you, Lee.